Hello, we're going to get going. We like to run a tight ship. We start a little late, but that's built into the schedule. Welcome everyone to the final event of the fall semester of the SWIG program in Jewish Faith and Social Justice at the University of San Francisco. Where tonight we will learn with guest Dr. Suji Tamar Mattis, who will speak about the failure of the law and the potential of the law to help protect intersex children from unethical medical surgeries in the United States. My name is Aaron Han Tapper. It's my honor and privilege to work with this cutting edge program. Let me begin by thanking a number of people for their support for making this event possible. Thank you to the JSSJ staff and faculty member, Professor Oren Kroll Zeldin, as well as our program assistant, Ali Cunningham. Thank you to all JSSJ faculty. Thank you to the Department of Theology and Religious Studies for co-sponsoring this event, including Chairperson Vijaya Naga Raja. I'd like to take a brief moment and tell you about our SWIG program in JSSJ. There are also green booklets towards the front of the room that can help uh, and describe our work in greater detail. Please take one on your way out. You can also sign up to be on our listserv. A sheet can be found next to the green booklets. This will be brief. In 1977, Melvin, Swig, and several friends saw the need to establish a Jewish studies program in the San Francisco Bay Area. For them, the University of San Francisco, a premier Jesuit Catholic institution of higher learning, was the natural home. Not only was this the first endowed chair or Jewish studies program at any college or university in the Bay Area, but SWIG and USF had actually broken ground on a global scale. It was the first Jewish studies chair or program at a Catholic university anywhere in the world. In 2008, the program was relaunched as the SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice. Once again, USF and the program broke historical ground, this time in becoming the first academic program worldwide to formally link Jewish studies with social justice. Including a minor in this field, in the classroom, our program offers a wide range of significant Jewish studies courses not found in other educational settings, as well as an annual intensive Hebrew language summer program. Our minor in JSSJ offers an array of courses not offered in other schools, such as social justice, activism, and Jews, social justice in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Jews, Judaism, and Jewish identities, funny Jews, queering religion, black Jewish relations, and more. Over the past 40 years, literally tens of thousands of students have taken our Jewish studies courses. Hundreds are enrolled each year. In the 2017-18 year alone, we had more than 1,000 students in Jewish studies classes. Beyond the classroom, we have a number of extraordinary events that are free and open to the public, which thousands have also attended. Some of the events, uh, some of the topics we focus on are Israel and Palestine, Holocaust and genocide, and we have four annual events, a fall speaker series focused on Jewish identities, a fall human rights lecture, a spring social justice lecture, and a spring social justice Passover Seder. There are many ways to change the world for the better, a multitude of pieces to the puzzle regarding what each of us can do to help move and even transform the world into its potential called in Hebrew, Tikkun Olam. Through the Jewish Studies and Social Justice program, we, leave, we believe that education is the best long-term way to create systemic change. Whether one has the time to take a semester-long course or a mere few hours to hear from a single speaker, education is fundamental to making our world better, paramount in shining the spotlight on the margins, on oppressed communities who are mistreated, merely because of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sex, sexual orientation, or another social identity. It's a privilege this evening to introduce Dr. Suji Tamar Mattis, a family physician and a longtime advocate for the intersex community. She's a member of the medical advisory boards for the AIS DSD support group and for Interact Advocates for Youth, organizations that support intersex people and their families. Interact is an international human rights organization that supports the rights of intersex youth. Their testimony has been critical in the development of position statements opposing non-consensual genital surgery by the World Health Organization, Amnesty International, and both the United Nations Office of the High Commission for Human Rights and the United Nations 
special rapporteur on torture. Last year, Dr. Tamar Mattis was one of two researchers who produced the Human Rights Watch report titled, I Want to Be Like Nature Made Me, Medically Unnecessary Surgeries on Intersex Children in the United States. This report outlines human rights violations against intersex people here in America. This year, she was invited to testify before the California legislator in favor of SCR 110, a resolution supporting intersex people in California. Dr. Tamar Mattis is also the founder of the Transgender Clinic at Santa Rosa Community Health Centers, which has provided health care for the trans community of the North Bay for over a decade. In this clinic, she was able to train residents and medical students in the appropriate care of transgender patients. Dr. Tamar Mattis was recently, very recently, appointed an affiliated faculty member at the Institute for Health and Aging at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, where she's working on research regarding adult intersex people and their access to health care. Note, note that immediately after her talk, we'll have an opportunity to ask Dr. Tamar Mattis questions during a brief question and answer session with all of you. Please well, join me in welcoming our fourth annual JSSJ Human Rights Lecturer, Dr. Suji Tamar Mantis. Today's talk. We're going to talk about how we got here. We're going to talk about what is intersex, and then we're going to talk about what happens to intersex people. And then we'll end with what you can do to help, and then we'll take questions. Okay, how we got here, and it did not start with intersex people. So, um, so I'm going to tell you a story. So I want you to all settle in, take a deep breath. <sighs> I'm going to tell you the story that started in 1967. Um, it's not a happy story. Um, it is, it's about a case that's been called the John, John Joan case. And this starts with a child who's not intersex. In 1967, a psychologist named John Money undertook a radical experiment on a toddler. Bruce and Brian Reimer were twin brothers. Um, Bruce had a circumcision that went incredibly wrong and horribly mutilated his penis. 
Dr. Money saw this as an opportunity to test his theory on whether <coughs> gender was based on, on a social construct, like nurturing, or if it was nature, something you were born with, which was the big question of that day. And so he took this child and he was able to convince the kid's parents to remove the rest of his penis and his testicles and surgically feminize his genitals and raise him as a girl and put him on hormones when he hit puberty and never tell him what had happened. They renamed Bruce Brenda. Here's Brenda and her twin brother. Uh, Dr. Money was able to go to conferences. He wrote, he wrote many articles and was able to go to conferences and to say, we have figured out what causes gender. It's like, because we took this child in the early period and we made this kid into a girl, and this took, and this kid has, raised, has been raised and is a super happy girl and is you know, very feminine, we know now that gender is nurture. It is a social construct, it is not nature. But the fact is that the child had strongly resisted the gender assignment. Um, she insisted that she was a boy. She eventually became depressed and suicidal. When she was 14, her parents finally told her the truth about what had happened to her. And he immediately began to live as a boy and took the name David. Dr. Money knew of the child's strong resistance to the gender assignment, but did not report it. In fact, he had actually falsified his research. As an adult, this is David Reimer as an adult, David was very bitter and angry about what had happened to him, and he referred often to his childhood as a pit of darkness. In 2004, at the age of 38, he committed suicide. And this would have been a horrific, a horrific and awful story if it had ended there. But it did not end that. Because of this falsified research, people who were dealing with intersex children decided that they could apply this to intersex children, that there was a plastic period in childhood where somebody's gender could be changed and reinforced with surgery and hormones. Let's step back for a second. We're going to talk about what is intersex. So intersex the way I'm going to define it today is a biological condition in which people are born with bodies that don't fit neatly into our understanding of what is male or female. And this could be because of their chromosomal sex, their internal reproductive organs, or their external genitalia. <coughs> Intersex is often called disorders of sex development by physicians. We prefer the term differences of sex development. It's less stigmatizing. There are a lot of different types <clears throat> excuse me, of intersex conditions. There's androgen sensitivity syndrome and congenital adrenal hyperplasia and many others, but I'm actually going to talk about just those top two to give you an idea of what is involved in, in some different intersex conditions. So people who have androgen sensitivity syndrome, they're born with XY chromosomes, but part of their, their chromosomal makeup is it actually loses what's called the SRY gene, which is allows the body to recognize and use androgens or testosterones. And this means that the, the body can never actually virilize. You cannot actually have different degrees of not seeing this particular uh, male hormone. And so what happens because of the XY chromosomes, the internal reproductive organs progress toward, they, they end up having uh, internal testes, they don't have a, a uterus, they don't have ovaries, but externally they can't see the signals that would turn the genitals down that male pathway and create a, a penis and, and a squirrel sac. And so when they're born they tend to look very, very female. And people don't often know that they have this condition until they're in puberty and they don't have a period. And that's when they're kind of caught up a lot into the whole medical system. People have partial androgen sensitivity. They have some ability to see the testosterone, and so their genitals will develop somewhat along the male line, but they don't completely what we call virilize. So they will end up with genitals that look what, as we call them, 
in medicine, which is really where the term ambiguous, because I've always thought ambiguous is a funny term to talk about genitals, because if they're your genitals, they're kind of not that ambiguous to you. <laughs> Here's some uh, uh, AIS uh, activists. And I'm also going to briefly talk about uh, congenital adrenal hypoplasia. Uh, this is a condition where um, in people who have XX chromosomes, um, in the uterus, the, as the fetus is developing, the adrenal glands start kicking out way too much what are called androgens, and the, the fetus starts virilizing. So the XX chromosomes tell the fetus to start producing ovaries and a uterus, but the excess androgens that are coming from the adrenal glands tell the body to start developing externally along a male pathway. And so you can have a lot of genital variations from this uh, particular um, condition. And those can range from uh, uh, what would look like a normative girl, baby girl with a large clitoris, or could even look like what we would call a normative baby boy with a penis and an empty scrotal sac because they do have um, ovaries in their abdomen. And here are some uh, CAH activists. Okay, so now you have kind of an idea about what intersex conditions are. We're going to talk about what happens to intersex people in the United States and actually everywhere there is Western medicine. So anywhere there's Western medicine, intersex kids are uh, at risk of non-consensual, medically unnecessary surgeries. What are these surgeries? These are some of the surgeries intersex children uh, receive. Um, they often receive sterilization without their consent, uh, removal of the, the testes. Uh, if a doctor has decided that their clitoris is too large, the clitoris will be reduced or recessed. Later, if they do not have a vagina that the doctors decide is large enough, the vagina will be created, and there's also many other surgeries. I just want to be clear, what we're talking about right now are cosmetic surgeries. Now, if you're born where the urine can't leave your body, that is a problem, and you do need some surgery so that urine can actually leave your body. That's important, right? You need poop to leave the body, you need your urine to leave the body. But, if you're talking about a clitoris that's too large, that's a cosmetic issue. And these are the only cosmetic surgeries we do on infants. Furthermore, the ideal time for these surgeries is six months to two years, but probably closer to six months. As you can imagine, the effects of general surgery are, you can have a lot of effects from these general surgeries. And these can be both emotional and physical. I think that I think it's important to remember that the timing of these surgeries is based on the David Reimer case. David Reimer was not intersex, but because Dr. Money came out with this idea that you could change and enforce somebody's gender by doing surgery early, that is what this push of doing this early surgery is from. Um, which unfortunately leaves the child out of making any decisions here. And so what is the most, uh, the, the most obvious outcome that we noted from, from this treatment model? The most obvious outcome is loss of trust. So the breaking of the trust between the patient and the medical world is huge. In our research, we interviewed um, intersex people. We described feelings of dread and horror when attempting to access health care. And for some, this has led them to completely avoid health care altogether as adults. The physical effects of these surgeries can also be pretty severe. They can include lack of sexual response, inability to orgasm, scar tissue, it can be very painful, it can lead to incontinence, and also to frequent urinary tract infections. Because of these terrible outcomes, intersex people started to get together and to speak out about what had happened to them. Um, in 1993, the first support groups were formed, the Intersex Society of North America, which has since gone and become other stuff, and um, the AIS DST support group actually started back around that time. At this point in time, um, 
we thought that if doctors just knew how bad these outcomes were for adults, they would stop doing them. And we were really, really naive about, about that because they're still doing them today. So still intersex kids face non-consensual, medically unnecessary genital surgeries. So let's talk for a few moments about the reasons given for surgery. 2016, the uh, Journal of Pediatric Urology published a statement about the aims of genital surgeries for intersex people. One of the first aims was to restore functional genital anatomy to allow future penetrative intercourse as a male or female. Which is kind of an interesting thing. If you think, you know, there are a lot of people in the world who don't want to have uh, penetrative intercourse. And we're making this decision for babies, right? Uh, last year, Lawrence Baskin doubled down on this concept of restoring normal anatomy. And this was published um, just last year. And actually, jump ahead and just look at that last part. He says that preserving sexual function, you, that they aim to try to prefer, preserve sexual function of the clitoris by accepting moderate degrees of hypertrophy as normal and strategically reducing clitoral size only in the most severely virilized patients. Larry Baskin, by the way, is the chief of pediatric neurology over at UCSF. So let's look at this, what this statement says to decode the, the medical part of it. The statement basically says that if a doctor decides that as a baby your clitoris is too large, that despite the fact that they know you might lose some sexual function, that they will reduce it to make it look normal. The idea also here of restoring normal anatomy in female patients with atypical genitalia. In medicine, we talk a lot about uh, restoring normal anatomy in somebody who's had like a horrible accident or you know they've had like their hand has gotten into a thresher or they're, they've stepped on a long landmine. This is where you're restoring normal anatomy. When somebody's born with something, that's normal for them, and it, there's no restoration. Um, let's talk about oops, another reason for surgery that's often given is parental choice. This is like a really fascinating thing, actually. Um, the uh, pediatric urologist actually published this year, we as a field are not for or against surgery, but we are for the preservation of parental rights, meaning that you can't prevent parents from electing to have these surgeries on their children. That you can't stop parents from, from making a girl's clitoris that they decide is too big and small. Um, <clears throat> I find this to be a really funny kind of reason because in the state of California, in the United States, and as a society in general, we do limit the parents' rights, right? You are not allowed to get your child a tattoo. You're not allowed to beat your child. And in the state of California, you're not allowed to take your child to a therapist to make them not gay. But this is what they're saying about why you have to do surgery on intersex people. And then my favorite reason for um, my favorite reason for for giving for, for doing surgery on intersex people is that we can't stop doing surgery. This is a um, <clears throat> also in the uh, Journal of Pediatric Urology, came out two years ago. I'm just going to read this to you and then we'll like, go into this a little deeper. There is a general acknowledgement among experts that timing, the choice of the individual, and irreversibility of surgical procedures are sources of concerns. So we understand these problems. There is, however, little evidence provided regarding the impact of non-treated DSDs, disorders of sex development, during childhood for the individual development, the parents, the society and the risk of stigmatization. Let's look at that last part really close. We don't know what the impacts of not doing surgery on people with ambiguous genitalia are for that person, the family, or for society. So what are we talking about here? We're not doing surgery on this child to help them or to improve their health in any way whatsoever. We are doing surgery on this child because it might disrupt society. Which is just, I think, and I've been doing this for 24 years, and 
the big question everybody has is why is this still happening? And it's kind of like stepping into the twilight zone, right? It's like, okay, I don't know, why is this still happening? And I think this might really underline that more than any other reason I can come up with, that there is this fear of intersex bodies being out there in the world that could disrupt something. So what's changing? So there's some good news. Um, in the last few years, we've had many international human rights bodies have made statements opposing these surgeries on our six children. <clears throat> in fact, every single human rights organization that has looked at this issue has found this to be a human rights violation has come out against it. Um, last month, California became the first state in the country pass a resolution supporting intersex people and opposing early non-consensual uh, medically unnecessary surgeries on babies. This is a resolution, it's not a law. So these surgeries are still being done here in California, here at UCSF. We're gonna get to this last part, which is what can you do? Okay, so here's the part of the presentation where I'm going to make a pitch to all of you listening out there. I know it's really, this is really upsetting and it's really horrific. And I've been doing this for 24 years and it's still upsetting and it's still horrific. So we need you. We need each and every one of you to talk about this to everybody you know. Because any of you could have an intersex child or know somebody who has an intersex child. And knowledge is really power in this situation. You can call UCSF and tell them you do not want this happening in your city. You can call your state and legislative um, representatives and tell them you want this to be stopped. You can call the San Francisco Human Rights Organization or Human Rights Commission and tell them you want this to be stopped. Because to be clear, this is really the worst ethical failure of medicine and physicians are not going to stop themselves. As Pockney said, whenever a doctor cannot do good, he must be kept from doing harm. And it is up to all of us as a society to stop this harm. And I, I hope you can help us. Thank you very much. So we set aside time for people to ask questions, especially because for many uh, individuals, the issue of intersex is something they hear nothing about. Um, so please, if anyone has any questions, our speaker has a mic, and I can pass this mic to you as well. Thank you. Thank you for a very moving talk. Um, I wanted to understand two things. Um, before 1967, I was curious what was the common practice among physicians prior to this particular case that seemed to shift everything toward a certain direction? And then the second question is cultural. You specifically mentioned within Western-influenced medical establishment areas. So I was curious if you could give us a hint or two. Um, I'm originally from India, and I know a little bit about that region and um, the cultural non-abnormality I can say that word <laughs> um, in that context of intersex subjects, you know. Um, and so I'm just curious, what is the relationship between what's happening in the Western constructions of gender and intersex and non-Western constructions of intersex? Thank you. Good questions. So previous to this, previous to 1967, the interesting thing is John Money actually did a paper. I think it was an undergraduate thesis paper he did or maybe it was a graduate thesis, I can't remember, where he actually looked at that question, what happens to intersex people in our society? And he found that they were fine. And they lived, you know, perfectly fine lives. And at that period of time, you were assigned your gender, you weren't allowed to change it, they made their best guess, which is really what I think, in some ways, we should do now, right? If you have a baby, you're gonna make your best guess, but of course, as with any baby, you've gotta realize that they could change their, their 
idea or idea of who they are when they get older. But um, but previous to surgical intervention, people were you know made the breast gas, people were assigned to gender, and that's how it went, right? And so at that point, if you look historically, you know, the 60s, the 50s and the 60s are where the medical world started saying what gender was. Before that, it was um, more of a religious issue. And of course, if you look back into like more ancient texts, both within India, within um, uh, Judaism, and other places, you see that, you know, of course, intersex people have been with us throughout history. It's a normal part of being a mammal or being an actual a vertebrate. And that people had to deal with the intersex people in the world forever. So people had different, different societies had different ways of, of slotting people into gendered places in their societies. Um, in different countries, so definitely in India, the, the hijra are, are where most intersex people end up. Um, I know that there was recently a case a few years ago of somebody who actually sued to become not a hedra because they decided that they weren't actually intersex. It was a fascinating little moment of history. But in other societies too, for instance, in the Dominican Republic, there's a genetic variation of what's called five alpha reductase. And so when you have a certain number of girls in your family, you know that one of those girls will most likely turn into a boy when they hit puberty, because that's when a different type of uh, testosterone is created that, this body, that these people's bodies can see and they start virilizing. So that is a really interesting society, which is sort of also really accepted in most ways that this is just a kind of a normal variation. However, as more Western medicine has been introduced there, less and less people are able to grow up the way they were. Um, and I actually should say there are some African countries where intersex children are considered to be witches along with their mothers and are killed. And we at Interact have actually done a couple of asylum cases to bring people into the United States. I know you guys have a lot of questions, don't be afraid. because they are looking at the possibilities of, of reproduction, which is a big step. Um, there's, so there's a couple of things. Uh, if somebody has uh, ovaries and the uterus, then they should be able to, under most circumstances, be able to be reproductive. They should be able to have um, uh, produce eggs, have babies, um, depending exactly on what their condition is, and whether they are started on female hormones at puberty, um, but that is definitely a possibility. There's a condition called Swire syndrome, which is a little like androgen sensitivity syndrome, where people have XY chromosomes and don't develop um, down that male pathway. But in Swires, you don't actually develop gonads at all. You have street gonads, which are the only gonads that actually need to be removed because those are really completely undeveloped tissue and they can become cancerous. Unlike this fear of cancer for the testes, not necessarily an issue, but in street gonads, those do need to be removed. They're never gonna function as gonads and they are very likely to become um, cancerous. But people with this condition do have, um, are, are born for the most part with uteruses and can and often do carry babies. Um, and then as far as AIS, people who have androgen sensitivity syndrome and have not got their testes removed, not now, but it's possible in the near future as we develop more and more reproductive technologies that those people could also be able to have a, a play part in reproduction as far as, as producing sperm. It's not, it's not possible now, 
but it is possible in the future. And one of the small bright parts in the world of, of um, these DSD teams is that there are a few hospitals where they are allowing these kids to keep their testes because they're not sure, like in 20 years, will this child be able to, to contribute towards um, reproducing. The other interesting thing about people with AIS is that if you cannot recognize testosterone at all, and you leave somebody's um, gonads in, their testes in, and when they hit puberty, when these girls hit puberty, they start producing testosterone from the, from the gonads, from the testes, and their body can't see it, so their body flips that over into estrogen, and they can go ahead with a, a female puberty without having to take any hormones on just what their body is producing. So there is a push for doing that as well. So most intersex conditions are not genetically transmitted. There are a few. So people with uh, androgen sensitivity syndrome, they do that does run in families. So that is a genetic um, that is genetically trans transmissible. There's also congenital adrenal hypoplasia. Some forms of that can run in families as well, and it is somewhat can be uh, genetically transmitted as well, as well as 5-alpha uh, derivatase can, is, is also a genetic issue. So, um, so I guess the answer, it depends, is with most intersex stuff, it depends on what the condition is, but it's possible depending on the condition. And also, maybe not. trying to define gender in the binary, and I wanted to know your thoughts about that, how intersex uh, people could be affected by changes. So, you know, uh, so I'm married to an attorney, and um, the funny thing about what the Trump administration has done is that they have not looked at all the different states that tried to define gender when they were trying to define marriages between a man and a woman and then they have to define what's a man and what's a woman. So they did not actually look at all the problems these different states had when they were trying to define gender. Because gender is a really, really tough thing to, to, to pinpoint, right? It's not necessarily genetics, it's not necessarily, it's, it's a lot of different things that can come together to make gender, right? And I think that once, I think that it's a really poor attempt to, to legislate gender. Once again, it's failed when they were trying to make marriage between a man and a woman. It's going to fail again this time. So that's my, my personal opinion. Okay. Um, thanks. Do we have any solid data on what percentage of the population might be characterized as intersex? Yeah. So we do have some data on what the percentages are of each of these different types of um, intersex conditions. And when you put them all together, we tend to think that it's one in every 2,000 live births has some type of intersex condition that is at such a degree that would put them at risk of being pulled into this medical model and having unfortunate things happen to them. On that, I heard it likened to um, how frequent we see redheads. That's one in 2,000 approximately, is it? Actually, that's a, that's a lot bigger number, how many redheads are in society. Um, and when you're looking at that number, I don't particularly like that number, when you're looking at that number, which is like the same percentage as people with red hair, what you're looking at is people who have variations of their chromosomes um, that are not typically male or female. And so this is the interesting thing. We don't, unless you actually had your chromosomes checked, you don't know what your chromosomes are. You can make a pretty good guess, but you are not always right. And this is something that's come up, 
years ago and continues to come up for, people, for women who are participating in the Olympics that people will find odd chromosomal differences and then people in the past have been like, kicked out of the Olympics for not being women even if they've, like, they've had babies and have never thought of themselves as anything other than the women and do not actually carry an intersex diagnosis. So, um, the having XX or XY chromosomes and how that relates to your, your genitals is statistically right, but individually not. Uh, I wanted to thank you for coming out to talk with us. Um, I was curious specifically about the types of complications that arise during these involuntary surgeries, as well as how frequently they arise. And then I was also curious about your thoughts on uh, like circumcision and religiously related mutilation. Um, hmm. Let me kind of take that last part first. Um, when we first started working on intersex rights back in the 90s, this was a period of time where female genital mutilation became really big in the news in all these different states and the federal government had made laws against it. And we were like, great, so this is going to work for us. No, it didn't, because they specifically in many of these laws said unless it's like an intersex mutilation, you know, it's for the health of the child, the, the, the emotional health of the child is involved, right? Which, um, which is this really fascinating double thing, because what you're saying is, if people do it in other countries that aren't, you know, white Christian countries, they, this is wrong, but if we do it here, it's okay. Why are people doing this in other countries? They're doing it so that their children look like all the other girls in their society and can be marriageable. And that's the exact reason it's given for why we're doing it here, even stated in 2016 by the Society for Pediatric Urology, so that young children can have normal penetrative intercourse as a man or a woman. That's the same exact reason that your child will be normal within your society. So this is this really fascinating moment of cultural racism that if you do it over there, it's wrong, but if we do it to our people, it's science. I think this is okay, it's medicine. Um, somebody actually did finally write a really great article about that, looking at those two issues and, and really deconstructing them. I can't remember who it was, but that was published a couple of years back. Uh, the other side of that is what complications happen. Last year or the year before, there was a, an FDA uh, warning, that came out, a warning that came out of the FDA that showed that children that have surgery under the age of two tend to have much worse outcomes from the anesthesia. And there are a lot of anesthesia problems. This has really changed how we look at in medicine, how we look at doing surgery on infants and children for everything else. It has not changed how we look at doing surgery on intersex babies yet. Um, because I think, once again, the thought is that people's bodies, if they're not normative, if they're atypical, that's such a horrific thing that we could risk anything to make sure that you don't grow up that way. And this is kind of the monster hypothesis that people talk about sometimes. It's like, yeah, you are so monstrous that, it, that this could, we know these procedures could kill you, especially for kids with CAH who have salt wasting and they've got very touchy metabolic issues and any kind of stress can actually make them go into a, a, a steroid crisis and die. But still, it's really important to do surgery on these children before the age of two because it's, it's worth risking their lives to prevent them from becoming, growing up as these age people. Thank you. Hello. I was wondering if you've noticed a difference in the perception of the doctors. Have they changed their willingness to stop doing these surgeries, or is it still sort of typical for them to respond, well, of course, we're going to do it? Or has it been a shift? Um, so we went to 19 different hospitals last year to interview for uh, the HIW report. Um, and no, there's not been a shift at, at all among any of the hospitals. 
Um, one of the hospitals actually told us, one of the, the DSD team members told us after the election, um, when we were interviewing them in 2016, right after the election, they said that, oh yeah, there's a lot of parents, there's some parents that have been choosing not to do surgery, but you know, now that Trump's in office, we expect a lot more to. Which I was like, are you kidding me? It's like, the generals you grow up with depends on who's the president when you're born. It's like, where's the science in that? It doesn't make any sense at all. And um, then we presented these five, the, this report to the International DSD Conference in Copenhagen last year, which is where all the people who do these surgeries and all the endocrinologists who take care of these kids are. And they go and they talk about their techniques. And um, yeah, and we were pretty much told, oh yeah, I agree. Um, now the interesting thing that we found both in this report and in talking to other and talking to people is that within these these teams, uh, medical teams within these hospitals, most people completely disagree with this treatment. However, hospitals are and medical centers are very very hierarchical, right? You can't say no to whoever the top guy is or the top person is. And people were afraid to speak up. But I think one of the things that's really important to realize is that we're beginning to, so look, this is like a human rights issue, right? And we know, to paraphrase Martin Luther King Jr., the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And so we know how this is gonna end. We know how this is gonna come out. And all we need is finally for the people who are still hanging on there doing this, and I can name the ones who are doing this in, in the United States. It's, it's not a majority of doctors who think this is a good idea. It's just a handful of people, it's more a couple handfuls of people, that believe this is a good idea. And what we need is that all those people that are working with them to, you know, talk about how they think it's wrong or refuse to participate in the surgeries and risk losing their jobs. And this will stop. I mean, this is. Yeah, this is, I mean, the other thing, the other thing I think about a lot too in asking the surgeons that are doing this is, do you want to be the last doctors working in the Tuskegee experiment? I mean, you know how this is going to look. You know, the light of history is on you right now. You know how this is going to look. What are you thinking? But so many of these people are so stuck in where they are that they can't, they can't stop. They, they can't stop looking at, intersex people as non-human and that have to like fix them. So yeah, that's that's what I okay. um, I really enjoyed your presentation first. Um, my question is more about like why are we concerned with people's genitals and what they look like? <coughs> it's like it doesn't make any sense to me. Like there's absolutely no reason we need to be concerned with a child's genitals or an adult's genitals unless we're taking care of them or we're sleeping with them. And I'm not thinking that their doctor is going to do either of those things. Yeah, that's the question. <laughs> I mean, yeah, welcome to my world. This makes no sense. And that's why I have the red and the blue pill up at the very first slide, right? The second slide. It's because this makes no sense. And I have to tell you also that Kyle Knight, who is my coworker, and she does a really amazing job of narrating the video we put out on the HIW.org website on intersex, this intersex report. The, you know, he is a seasoned human rights worker. He's like talked to people before they were being murdered by the government. He's been all over the world. He's like, you know, worked, he's dealt with warlords, he's dealt with like torture survivors, with all this stuff. And he is very, very public about saying this is the first issue he's looked at and worked on that has made him cry himself to sleep. This is the first time he's actually had to get a therapist because it's that bad. This is crazy and it makes no sense whatsoever. We should have been able to make this stop 24, 25 years ago, right? When I talk to my fellow physicians, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go and do this talk tonight. They're like, what about that? I thought we stopped doing that 20 years ago. I was like, no, we did not. No, we have not. So yeah, great question. 
Um, Let me know hi. when I figure out an answer, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to um, clarify about something that stood out to me. Um, you mentioned earlier that the stated aim of the series is to allow penetrative intercourse mm -hmm. um, with clitoris reduction surgeries. From, I can't think of any way that a larger clitoris would stop um, penetrative intercourse. Is there any other physical difference that actually would legitimately inhibit penetration, or is it just kind of made up? Is it just purely a um, for looks, purely um, cosmetic surgery? That's a really good question. So yeah, no, there's no reason a large clitoris would prevent intercourse. Um, the other reason they tell parents of girls with large clitoris is to get surgery is that they, otherwise they will have increased urinary tract infections, also not proven. We do know from the small number of people who have not had surgery on their children with this condition that they have not had any inter, uh, urinary tract infections at all. And we do know from some of the studies that children who do have these surgeries do have a higher risk of, inter, of, of um, urinary tract infections. Um, there are surgeries, there are conditions where people are born without vaginas, and so that's kind of what they're pushing, I think, in that. Um, and then there are, there are, I'm sorry, there are conditions where uh, boys are born with small penises, um, and there's no real surgery that can like change that. So it is a really odd statement for them to say in so many ways. I mean, you're right. This, and you're, you're both right. All of you're right. This does not stand up to any kind of internal or external logic. It makes no sense. And yet, when I go and talk to these physicians, to these surgeons. They are just like, yeah. I actually had a, a doctor tell me last Friday, it's like, yeah, you know, I wish your people would come up with like some good research on this. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, well, it doesn't matter if we have any research about like how people do without surgery because this is still a human rights violation, you should stop doing it. Thank you. Um. I have had two patients that as adults wanted to have surgery, um, that had not had surgery as children and wanted to have surgery as adults. And the, the risks are so much lower in adulthood, right? Because you can visualize the tissue and you can get a really good cosmetic and a really good functional outcome from surgery when you're an adult, that as opposed to when you're like six months old and you can't really visualize the tissue as well. Um, and you can't visualize the nerves, and you have no ability really to, to preserve that, that the neurological function. But if, as an adult, the, um, the surgeons that do transgender sex reassignment surgery, they are great. This is like what they do. This is their job. They do an excellent job at this, and have been really great about taking patients that have wanted to have uh, changes in adulthood or who wanted to undo some of the things that were done to them in childhood. You can't undo all of it. I've had uh, patients who wanted, who were um, not given a choice about having vaginas made, who had one of those removed, and, and really let me take those, those covered and all that done in the state of California. You covered this a little bit, and I'm like, kind of know the answer, but I'm just like, get a firm answer. Um, is it possible to not be um, recognized as an intersex when you are born, and then later on in life, um, kind of those characteristics uh, coming up, like when you get puberty, for example, but um, them not showing at birth? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's what happens a lot to to girls with AIS when they hit puberty and don't um, start menstruating. Yeah. Um, so Hi, uh, 
thank you so much for your talk. Um, I want to go back to the cultural questions that you sort of, um, they're making you so puzzled and the rest of us so puzzled. And first of all, I want to ask, what do parents say? Because it seems to me that doctors are pushing this off now onto parents and saying it's about parents' rights. But this sort of like, clearly something is going on here about gender binaries and imposing gender binaries and making some sort of cultural rules. They're not explicit. Would you mind talking a little bit more about the parents and about the cultural um, aspects? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that happens in this, this um, treatment model is that it really destroys families. And we see this, so um, the AISDSD support group is a, it has a big conference every year. And people come to the conference, either adults or parents with their kids. And you will see this over and over again, that, that parents felt that they were pushed into these surgeries. They did not have options in, in how and what was going to happen to their kids. And they were told they had to get these done and everything would be fine. And to not tell their kids to go from there. And when the kids find out later what had happened to them, a lot of them get really, really angry. And there's a lot of rifts within families. Um, And, you know, when you had a baby, that's a really delicate time for most people, right? It's a really raw, hard moment to have somebody say, your child is wrong, it's sick, it's, something's wrong with your baby. And to, to create that a kind of um, fear and worry in the parent is, I mean, you know, you can handle these in different ways, right? There's a lot of different ways. We have children who are born with lots of different conditions, and we know how to manage this with parents. It's like, yes, your child has this difference, and that's fine. It's going to be fine. And this is how we're going to support you. This doesn't happen for, for parents of intersex children. They're told, your child has this problem, and we're going to fix it, and it's going to be fine. But we're going to fix it for you. And if people start to push back against that, then they start getting all these stories. It, it's usually, now the surgeons are saying that if you don't do these surgeries, your child will commit suicide because we have research on transgender kids who didn't get access to appropriate health care and they have a higher rate of suicide. It's like, it has nothing to do with what's going on here. But that's what they tell parents now. It's like, yeah, so you better do this for your child commit suicide or, you know, They'll be teased. They'll, you know, they'll have all the stigma. Um, when in fact, you know, there's no evidence for any of that. There's absolutely no evidence for that. Um, yeah, it is. Um, it is just so puzzling and so awful. And then we had. So we have all these parents telling us that. We were pushed, we were bullied into doing this. I have actually talked to several parents who were told that if they didn't consent to the surgery, that they were going to call Child Protective Services and have their children removed and have the surgery done. Um, yeah. And especially if you are poor or of a different um, socioeconomic class or not white, that's a lot more of a threat than it is if you're a like, rich white person. Right? So it is a really, really tough. Place. And so, you know, the other funny thing that, that they, they, these doctors and their teams will say that parents won't accept their children, especially if they are from like a fundamentalist Christian or like a poor background, they won't be able to accept their children. Which is so not the experience I've had of talking with parents. I mean, there are all of these serious fundamental Christians who would really like hate me as a queer Jew, to that I am good friends with because they have intersex babies and they have decided this is the way God made my baby and no doctor is going to step in and tell me that this that God was wrong. So it is really the the amount of racism racism and classism within the, the facilities that are doing this stuff is really fascinating too as well. This is such a huge place that we should be doing research. And really, we should be doing research on the attitudes of these physicians and how they're thinking, because something else like this is going to come up in the future. And if we can figure out what has happened to these particular doctors 
and try and, and look for it in the future, we could prevent what, an unknown harm from happening, right? This is really a place we should be doing a lot more research, but, you know. Hi. Um, I, uh, as I'm sitting here listening to the discussion, um, I, I think about the lack of social infrastructure for, for intersex people. Um, something that comes to mind for me is like, uh, like competitive sports. Uh, and, and it makes me wonder, uh, at, at what point should intersex people uh, be able to make that decision, if there is a decision to be made about, uh, about what they do going forward? Because I, I could totally see how, how it could, could affect your ability to say, that you play competitive basketball from an early age. Um, just as an example. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think that um, look, we have a protocol for, for kids who have gender difference, right? We have a protocol for transgender youth in, in the WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender um, Health Providers. The protocol for dealing with transgender youth is you do re reversible stuff first, right? So if a child comes out at the age of nine or something, maybe you're going to block the puberty before you wait a couple of years, do a lot of therapy before you decide which puberty they want to go through, which is most appropriate, and then you can start them on hormones, and then don't do surgery, don't do the irreversible things until they hit the age of like, you know, 18, maybe 17, depending on what the, the surgeries are. And that's all we're asking for, for, for intersex people. Intersex people should have that same choice. You do the reversible stuff first, Right. You give like people a chance to, to make those decisions as they get older, and then you can do the irreversible stuff second, and you can do the surgeries or whatever people want once they're old enough to really understand what's involved in, in the surgery and that there's no going back from it, and it's irreversible. Does that make sense? And I think this is a question of choice, this really is. This is a question of bodily autonomy, and that is really all we're asking in this situation, is that a six-month-old can't consent to something that will change their life forever. A two-year-old can't consent to something that will change their life forever. But a 17-year-old could, an 18-year-old could, a 20-year-old could. I just have to ask the question, does circumcision change a child's life forever? I don't know. I can't answer that question. I'm not a specialist on circumcision. I don't do them. I'm not a specialist on them. Um, um, no, I didn't. Um, for you um, personally in your practice, do you work specifically with intersex people um, and intersex youth? Is that something that you specifically um, seek out um, with the patients that you choose to work with? No, it's not. And that, that issue is because. Um, and that's an issue of how medicine's done and how it's regionalized. And so to uh, be able to do that, we have to open a clinic and have people come in from all over, right? And so we do have clinics where people come in from all over at like UCSF and at these different hospitals, but they're all coming in because these are where people are being, there's a referral system that happens when a baby's born and this is how it happens if they get to these particular surgeons, right? We don't have that set up for people don't want to have surgery. In fact, sometimes when we've talked to some parents in our report where when they decline to have surgery, they actually were medically abandoned by their doctors who said, well, then I can't help you anymore. And they, you know, I won't see you. Which is really, within medicine, that's really something you never do. You do not abandon your patient. And it's shocking if you're for a doctor to do that. It's just unbelievably shocking. Is there anything that um, kind of like someone to my friend said, um, that like there's any particular protocol that uh, intersex uh, people wouldn't be able to join the military, for instance. Is there any uh, any um, thing like restricting them going into there? There shouldn't be. You know now. You know there's still the question between in the military whether or not trans people can be in the military. Uh, I have patients from my trans clinic who are now in the military and. Um, 
and it should not be, I mean, currently, this is a question actually, either currently it is listed as an issue, as a medical problem that could keep you out of the military, but if somebody who is trans is, is able to go in, this is an easily fixable thing. So it should not keep people out of the military at all. In fact, one of the, um, there's somebody who just did this a couple of years ago, did a lawsuit to get uh, an eye on their passport, an intersex person, and that person had served in the military. I don't know what their condition is. Maybe one last question. Um, I imagine people compare you non-consensual cosmetic surgery to venal genital mutilation in other countries. And you spoke a little bit earlier about cultural racism, but what are the other dangers of framing the conversation about intersex rights in this way? What are, what are the dangers? Yeah. Um, it's real, that's a really excellent question. So I think, you know, you should definitely have an attorney talk about this, and I'm not an attorney. I think that I can talk to you from a doctor's perspective. Um, as a physician, I think that is such a, a trigger for a lot of doctors that I think they wouldn't think they wouldn't take anything else you said seriously after that. Uh, this is an issue we had when the Special Repertoire on Torture uh, declared that intersex surgeries are uh, torture in medicine. That doctors that do these surgeries went on and on and on about how hurt they were to be called torturers, and it shut down a lot of conversation, which, you know, truthfully, I don't think we're going to have that much conversation anyway with people who can't stop doing this, right? Um, I mean, and the idea that this is a human rights violation also really upsets the doctors that are doing this. But, what? No, I'm not right now, right? But I think, you know, part of that, a part of what I think is, if someone's calling you a torturer, and someone's calling you a mutilator, and someone's calling you a human rights violator, maybe it's time to look at what you're doing and stop it. <laughs> you know? Up until six years ago, I used to deliver babies. I used to do full, full, scope, scope, full scope family practice, and now I'm really enjoying the sleeping all night thing, which is awesome. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but like, you know, I, delivering babies is the most litigious thing you can do in California, which is seen as the most litigious state in the union. And if I did something that just like upset even like 1% of the people that I was like working with, that they said that they wanted to sue me, I would look at what I was doing and I'd change it. So I don't understand how people who are doing this, and they have thousands of people now coming back saying, what you did to me was wrong. Why aren't they changing what they're doing, right? It just makes no sense to me at all. And on top of that, I also want to say one other thing, is that I think you also have to look at the fact that if you are someone who's been doing this your whole professional life, to stop and say what you're doing has harmed people, to stop and think back to the hundreds and hundreds of surgeries you've done and these hundreds of kids, and to admit to yourself that you have harmed somebody, you've harmed all those children irrevocably, irreversibly, that takes like a really special person to go through that. And we need that first person to come out and to make that really intense emotional inventory and look at what they've done and to be able to step up and say, I have harmed people and I'm going to stop. And I think in some ways that's where we're not seeing people stop because that is really hard.